In this video, I'm going to introduce and outline for you uh, the early causes and conflicts of the Cold War. The Cold War marks the spread of communist ideas that originated in Europe and were first implemented in Russia, the spread of these ideas across the world. And it marks efforts on the part of uh, a group of nations, mostly represented by the United States of America, but by other European nations as well, which we might refer to as the West, to resist the spread of communism and the implementation of communism across the world. And so we see in this conflict, or the way that this conflict is typically framed, as it's between the promise of a communist utopia, the overthrow of systems that are portrayed as unjust, versus the promise of freedom that's provided uh, by the West. That's the language that the West uses. And so we begin with the conference at Yalta. This conference is held uh, with uh, the Russian army very close to Berlin as we come towards the end of World War II. And so Stalin is a very, in a very powerful position. Churchill and Roosevelt the other leaders of the most important allied nations are in much weaker positions, uh, partly because they're competing with one another. Roosevelt wants to ensure that after the war, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. Churchill wants to try and save the British Empire. Neither of those goals really run in conflict uh, with Stalin's goals. Uh, or impinge on Russia, but they do run counter to each other. And so they're kind of, Roosevelt and Churchill are kind of competing to get Stalin on their side. So this is fantastic for Stalin. Um, he gets basically exactly what he wants, uh, most especially the repatriation of uh, Soviets or members of, uh, the, uh, members of Russia or citizens of Russia who had been captured, that even if they wanted to live outside the Soviet Union, they would be forced to be repatriated, and the division of Germany into an eastern zone at, ruled by Russia, or at least under the governance of Russia, and western zones under the governance of the leading allied powers. After the conference and at the end of the war, um, the Soviets take control of Eastern Europe, even though one of the agreements of the conference was that all of these countries would be allowed free, ele free elections. Uh, Stalin and the Russians go in there and basically take these countries over um, and institute communist party regimes. And there's little that Roosevelt and Churchill can do to prevent them. The American response, or a party of the American response to the Soviets taking over Eastern Europe, is the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, Roosevelt dies in 1945. He's replaced by his vice president, Harry Truman. Truman is much more concerned about the dangers of communism and the spread of communism than Roosevelt was. And so dropping the atomic bomb is a way of ending the war. It's also a way of Truman asserting America's power uh, to Stalin. And we see in his presidency Truman formulating what's called the Truman Doctrine, that everywhere in which the spread of communism becomes apparent, it will be opposed. Um, and this is implemented through what's known as the Marshall Plan, a system of economic aid to, in particular, to rebuilding Europe. Um, and But this aid that the Marshall Plan provides, it's designed... One, it's it's partly out of goodwill, um, but two, it, there's a political aspect to it. It's designed to make sure that these European countries remain in the camp of the West and in the camp of the United States and don't embrace communism and the rise or the allegiance or the dominance of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> One area in which the Truman Doctrine is tested early on is the episode called uh, the Berlin Airlift. So Berlin is in the eastern zone of Germany. It's in the zone of Germany that's controlled by the Soviets. Nevertheless, as the capital of Germany, it too was divided into four zones of occupation among the different Allied powers. And... <clears throat> In uh, 1949, the Russians surround all the roads and rail networks leading into the zones uh, that are controlled by other allied powers. 
And this is a flexing of Russian or communist muscle in this situation. This was standard Russian practice at the time to encircle a target, make sure he couldn't receive any food and supplies, but encircle it with soldiers so that if someone wants to break in and provide supplies, they have to attack a Russian soldier, they have to risk starting a war. People don't want to do that. In the end, the area that's encircled runs out of food and it adopts and accepts um, communist rule. So this was pretty standard practice for uh, Russian communism and it will continue to be standard practice throughout the war. Uh, this time, their allies resist allowing all of Berlin to fall into Russian control uh, by providing supplies for the populations in their zones in the city by air. And this was an immense undertaking. Many, many flights a day in order to land supplies in their particular zones of occupation. And a number of airmen even died carrying out these flights because they had to be carried out in all weathers because people in the city were depending on these flights every day to provide them with food. And this really marks, uh, if you will, moving on from World War II. Uh, it's really amazing that just a few years after the end of World War II, these pilots, English and American pilots mostly, are risking their lives in order to provide food for Germans who up until this point for basically the whole of the 20th century have been the great enemy. Uh, it's a sign that uh, these people now recognize that the enemy of America and Britain is not Germany, but is Russia. And it helps the Germans also to reintegrate themselves back into Europe, that they see themselves not as this uh, bad boy among the European nations uh, that then might want to lean towards communism and alliance with Russia against American influence. But they see themselves as being taken care of and being adopted and by, and by uh, America and the Western allies. And this encourages them to lean more towards the West and less towards communism. The last incident from the early years of the Cold War is the Korean War. Uh, Korea, which had been ruled as part of the Japanese Empire, which had been divided um, into North Korea and South Korea after the war. And North Korea becomes, uh, comes under the influence of communism. And so the North Koreans, with the encouragement and support of the Russians, invade South Korea and initially are successful. They're initially successful because uh, the Americans and their Western allies had expected the next war would be a nuclear war. They'd expected it was going to be uh, sort of a war of destruction fought with nuclear bombs. But in fact, this is a limited war. And so the Americans and the United Nations have to work kind of hard to get their countries up to steam um, to get them up to war production again. Uh, but once they do, they're at least able to fight uh, to a stalemate. Uh, so it becomes the United Nations and South Korea fighting against North Korea and China. China is afraid that America, which would be backing Chinese nationalists against the communists in the Chinese Civil War, is using this as a way, uh, as, as a way to prepare for an invasion of China. And so they enter the war on the side of the North Koreans. But as I say, the war ends up being fought at least to a stalemate. An armistice is agreed after Stalin's death in 1952, an armistice which remains in place today. Uh, what I always find really striking, and you can see this in the PowerPoint, is the difference in outcomes for the two halves of Korea after this war. Um, and you can see this picture in the PowerPoint that shows Korea at night. And you can see that South Korea has become this booming economy, booming capitalist economy through with American investment, while North Korea remains extremely poor. Uh, that's all for this video. Um, I'll be back with a couple more videos uh, during this section on the Cold War.